Welcome to your AP Statistics Chapter 26 lesson on chi-square tests of homogeneity and chi-square tests for independence. A test comparing the distribution of counts for two or more groups on the same categorical variable is called a chi-square test of homogeneity. A test of homogeneity is actually the generalization of a two-proportion z-test. The statistic that we calculate for this test is identical to the chi-square statistic for goodness of fit. In this test, however, we ask whether choices are the same among different groups. In other words, there is no model. The expected counts are found directly from the data, and we have different degrees of freedom. The assumptions and conditions are the same as for the chi-square goodness of fit test. You have the counted data condition, the data must be counts, randomization um, condition and 10% condition. As long as we don't want to generalize, we don't even have to check these conditions. Um, expected cell frequency condition, the expected count in each cell must be at least five. To find the expected counts, we multiply the row total by the column total and divide by the grand total. We calculated the chi-square uh, statistic as we did in the goodness of fit test. So we've got it there. It's the sum of the observes minus the expected squared over expected. In this situation, we have R minus 1 times C minus 1 degrees of freedom, where R is the number of rows and C is the number of columns. We'll need the degrees of freedom to find the p-value for the chi-square statistic. Examining the residuals. When we reject the null hypothesis, it's always a good idea to examine the residuals. For chi-square tests, we want to work with standardized residuals since we want to compare residuals for cells that may have very different counts. To standardize a cell's residual, we just divide by the square root of its expected value. So you take that deviation of observed minus expected and divide by the square root of the expected. These standardized residuals are just the square roots of the components we calculated for each cell, with the plus or the negative sign indicating whether we observed more cases than we expected or fewer. The standardized residuals gives us, give us a chance to think about the underlying patterns and to consider the ways in which the distribution might not match what we hypothesized to be true. Let's look at exercise 28 on page 646. A random survey of autos parked in the student lot and in, in the stat lot at a large university classified the brands by country of origin as seen in the table. Are there differences in the national origins of cars driven by students and the staff? So the first thing we're going to do is, considering our table there, we're going to write appropriate hypotheses. Now our null is that there's no difference in the the distribution, okay? The null would be the distribution of car origin is the same for students and staff, and the alternative would be the distribution of car origin is different for students and staff. So there's no difference in the distribution is our null, there is a difference in the distribution is our alternative. We need to check the necessary con assumptions and conditions. So for counts, um, we do have counts of cars. We don't have to check for randomness, but it does say there is a random, a random survey of cars stated. Um, so we can go ahead and generalize to the whole university. Um, expected counts are greater than five. And in fact, here are the expected counts. You always need to give a table of them. This 115.15, that is the number of American cars expected in the student lot. The 96.85 would be the number of expected American cars in the staff lot. So you may be asking, well, how did you get these? Well, you can either do like it told you to do um, previously. Let's go back. To find the expected counts, we multiply the row total by the column total and divide by the grand total. Okay, so we could do the row total times the column total divided by the grand total, or we can let our calculator can, uh, construct the expected matrix whenever we do the test of homogeneity. So it kind of seems like backwards there, but you actually go through and do the test so that the calculator will go ahead and create the expected matrix for you. Um, and that happens anytime you do a test of homogeneity. Actually, it does it for a test of independence, too. And you're going to say we choose two-way table test for either type of test. And I'm going to show you how to do that in a minute. 
All right, we're going to find the p-value of your test. So here's where I'm going to show you how to actually conduct the test, either on your scratch pad or on a calculator page in a document. Create a 3 by 2 matrix and enter the observed values in the matrix. Store the matrix in a variable, say OBS for observed, by pressing the little STOW key, typing OBS, and then pressing Enter. Then you're going to select Menu, Statistics, Stat Tests, and you're going to pick Chi-Square Two-Way Test. You want to enter OBS or whatever you named your matrix with your observed values when prompted for the observed matrix. Press Enter. You should get a bunch of results including your p-value of 0 0.01996. To see your expected value matrix, press the VAR key and select stat.exp exp matrix and press enter until it appears on your screen. Okay, you actually need to stop the video and practice doing that because you're going to have to be able to do that on rounds, on tests, and on the AP test. We want to state your conclusion um, and so due to our low p-value 0.02 we reject the null. There is significant evidence that the distribution of car origin is different for students and staff. So we link to our p-value, we state whether we reject or fail to reject the null, and then we state whether or not there is significant evidence for our alternative, hypo uh, alternative hypothesis, but we don't just state alternative hypothesis, we state what it actually says. Okay, chi-square test of independence. Um, contingency tables categorize counts on two or more variables so that we can see whether the distribution of counts on one variable is contingent on the other. A test of whether the, the two categorical variables are independent examines the distribution of counts for one group of individuals classified according to both variables in a contingency table. A chi-square test of independent uses the same calculation and as a test of homogeneity. It all depends on what you're trying to test and how you've collected your data. We still need counts and enough data so that the expected values are at least five in each cell. If we're interested in the independence of variables, we usually want to generalize from the data to some population. In that case, we'll need to check the data, um, that the data are a representative random sample from that population. Each cell of a contingency table contributes a term to the chi-square sum. It's helpful to examine the standardized residuals just like we did for test of homogeneity. Chi-square tests are common and tests for independence are especially widespread. We need to remember that a small p-value is not proof of causation. Since the chi-square test for independence treats two variables symmetrically, we cannot differentiate between the, uh, the direction of any possible causation, even if it existed. And there's never any way to eliminate the possibility that a lurking variable is responsible for the lack of independence. In some ways, a failure of independence between two categorical variables is less impressive than a strong consistent linear association between quantitative variables. Two categorical variables can fail the test of independence in many ways. Examining the standardized residuals can help you think about underlying patterns. So what can go wrong in using all the chi-square tests? Don't use chi-square methods unless you have counts. Just because numbers are in a two-way table doesn't make them suitable for chi-square analysis. They must be counts. Beware of large samples. With a, a sufficiently large sample size, a chi-square test can always reject the null hypothesis. So we, in, this, in this case, we actually don't want huge, huge samples. Don't say that one variable depends on the other just because they're not independent. Association is not causation. Dependence is a very sp um, specific statistical term, and we don't have tests for dependence. So don't say depends. Say they're not independent. Okay, so let's look at an example. We're going to look at exercise 29 from page 646. A poll conducted by the University of Montana classified respondents by whether they were male or female and by political party, as shown in the table. We wonder if there's any evidence of an association between being male or female and party affiliation. So there you've got your males and your females from this single poll there. They asked people if they were male or female, and then they asked them whether they were Democrat, Republican, or Independent. 
This is a test of independence. We're taking a single sample and testing the existence of an association between two variables within the sample so that we can make an inference about the existence of an association between those two variables within the population the sample represents. We're going to write appropriate hypotheses. The null hypothesis is there is no relationship or association between political affiliation and gender, or in other words, political affiliation and gender are independent. The alternative is that there is a relationship or association between political affiliation and gender. In other words, political affiliation and gender are not independent. Note, we did not use the word dependent anywhere. In statistics, dependence means something more specific than a lack of independence and, and is not appropriate here. Are the conditions for inference satisfied? Do we have counts? Do we have a random representative sample or expected counts greater than five? The data are counts of respondents to a poll. It is not stated that the sample was selected at random, but it is a plausible assumption to make. The sample may be representative of the population of Montana, so we will not be able to generalize the results to the entire United States, just to Montana. Um, expected counts are greater than five from the expected matrix created by the CAS while conducting the test, and then you actually give the matrix with all the expected counts and, and state that they are all greater than five. We want to find the p-value of our test. So we're using the, the same steps as for a test of homogeneity. So go back and review that if you need to. And we get a p-value of 0 0.0884. Now I consider that large. So due to our large p-value, about 0 0.09, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. These data do not provide evidence of a relationship between political association and gender. Okay, guys, that is it for this video. If you need to, go back and watch it again. Stop, practice with your calculator. Make sure you can use it, and I will see you in class next time. Have a good day.